Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metropolis Radio. Today we are talking about film noir. Now this discussion really kicked off with the release of, of Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley, which by the way, uh, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley is actually a remake of a 1947 uh, noir of the, of, of the same name. And as of the recording of this video, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley has only grossed three million eight hundred eight thousand eight hundred twenty-one eight hundred twenty-nine dollars domestically. We still have no numbers internationally, but those numbers may go up within the next couple of days. So it is it is important for me to earmark to uh, to ear, to earmark this date. But anyway. Uh, I then jump over to the Hollywood Reporter. This was a couple of days ago, and they publish a film history of film noir. And as I was reading through it, I figured, you know what? This really needs to be preserved in in, an in another medium. So we're just going to dig right into this, and that is film noir's early days, how studios resisted, then embraced the genre. Guillermo del Toro's neo-noir Nightmare Alley calls back to an age when the subversive quote-unquote murder mellers or off-kilter celluloid dirt face sharp criticism from censors, critics, and industry execs. Quote, we cannot send pictures overseas which show Americans as sordid people intent upon low objectives. Quote, the picture is a morbid, seamy story dealing with the dregs of humanity, wrote, ter wrote Terry Ramsey, editor of, Mo of Motion Picture Herald in 1946. The bottom feeder in question was Fritz Lang's Scarlet Street, which had somehow slipped by the Bren, by the Bren office to incite the wrath of, of, stri of straight-laced critics and, and municipal censors. Quote, one of these, one of these abominations now, now and then may be accepted in the flow of entertainment offerings, allowed, allowed Ramsey, but a cycle of like would be disastrous. But the cycle was already spinning out of control and well on its way to becoming a full-on genre. The French had already dubbed it film noir, but at the time, American critics didn't quite know what to call it or to make of it. They only knew it was they only knew it was a new and disturbing trend in Hollywood cinema, a provocation that threatened to alienate the family audience, outrage moral guardians, and bust up a profitable racket. The menace seemed to have arrived punctually at the end of World War II, but the genealogy stretched back further in time. In 1972, the then theorist and soon practitioner Paul Schrader spun an original story that name-checked a, a multiplicity of, cin of cinematic sources at home and overseas, German expressionism, universal horror, French melodrama, British thrillers, before the varied lineages crossbred into something distinctly American. The coinage film noir is usually credited to the French critic and screenwriter, and screenwriter Nino Frank, who in 1946 derived it from the black crime fiction of Marcel Duhamel's Serene Noir pu uh, publishing imprint. Raymond Bourne, and, and, I, I, and I know I'm going to mispronounce this name, I am not really good at pronouncing French names, I think it's uh, Etienne um, Chamathon, uh, codified the term in their pioneering study a panorama, of, uh, a panorama of American Film Noir, published in 1955. What exactly defined that something had long been a favorite, a favorite parlor game for film noir geeks? Is it or isn't it noir? Others have attempted to, de to develop a rigid taxon uh, ta taxonomy of icons, styles, and themes of the genre, as if by ticking off a sufficient number of generic signposts, a critical mass of noirness will clinch the case. Low lighting? Check. Flashbacks? Check. Elisha Cook Jr.? Check. The saner side of the fan base has adopted the formula Justice Potter Stewart used to define another elusive genre, I know when I see it. No matter how you cut it, the gene pool was predominantly German, the shadowy netherworld of German expressionism and the cold eye of the late Weimar era bequeathed a visual style and tonal attitude. The warped mindscapes of Robert Vine's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, the Waking Nightmares conjured by F. By F. W. Uh, Mur uh, Murnau's Nosferatu and Faust, the criminal profiling in Fritz Lang's M, and the Testament of Dr. Mabuse from 1933. In 1927, when, when, when Murnau defected to, from UFA to Fox, much of the local talent, including John Ford and, Fra and, and Frank Borzage, and Frank Borzage uh, came by the lot to check out his chops, the moving camera, the lighting effects, the multiple exposures. 
Uh, the other German parent, the darkest one, was Nazism. A statistically significant percentage of the great noir pro uh, prognators, Fritz Lang, Robert, Robert Soydmack, Billy Wilder, Edward G. Omer, uh, Edgar G. Omer, I'm sorry, uh, and Otto Preminger, fled Nazi Germany a step ahead of the Gestapo or were smart enough to sense what lurked around the corner. They were joined by boatloads of desperate refugees who didn't need to master the English language to find a means of expression in a visual medium. Set designers, lighting technicians, cameramen, and musicians. California was a paradise, but existence was precarious, always a visa stamp away from perdition. No wonder the films listing their bylines vibrate with a coiled tension and pervasive fear, the sense that it will all go wrong, that no matter how meticulous the murder plot or heist scheme, fate will trip you up. By osmosis and plagiarism, the sensibility and styles bled onto ad adjacent sound stages and nurtured a kind of paranoid style in American cinema. Born is in, bo and before, before I go any further, actually, I do want to address this comment. By osmosis and plagiarism, I don't remember who said this quote, but, um, but I heard this going, going to art school, you know, for, uh, for, for college. Uh, I believe it's an artist unknown. And, it, and, and the quote is something to the effect of, good artists copy, great artists steal. So before, so before the moral police come along and go, you know, oh my god, there was plagiarism in this genre. There's plagiarism in every single literary, film, and television genre Im imaginable. You know, so let, like, 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 just, you know, calm down. Yes, people steal from, yes, people steal from other people. George Lucas famously stole from Akira Kurosawa and Frank Herbert to create Star Wars. You know, but anyway, getting back to film noir here, uh, Boris Engster's Stranger on the Third Floor, which came out in 1940, which, by the way, has low lighting flashbacks and Elisha Cook Jr., is often cited as the first true noir exemplar. Quote, the fancy camera effects, lighting, and trick dubbing cost far more than was necessary for a, for a dulcetory B, Scott Variety, too arty for average audiences. The next year saw a trio of influential proto or partial noirs or authentic noirs, you know, wh whatever. John Huston's The Maltese Falcon, which famously starred uh, Humphrey Bogart. I Wake Up Screaming, which released in 1941, originally released under the unnoirish title Hotspot, and despite being Elisha Cook Jr. list, Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. It was during, not after World War II, that film noir first set down firm roots. In Blackout World War II and the origins of film noir, film scholar Sh uh, Sherry Chin and Sherry Chin and Beeson locates the emergent the emergence of the genre in the in the quote bleak realities of a world at war end quote a cinematic projection of the daily terrors of a generation dreading a telegram from the War Department or a bullet from the from the Wehrmacht uh, that knew what that knew what it was like to live on borrowed time. Amid the patriotic uplift and upbeat escape, escapism pervaded by wartime Hollywood, the films only seemed like outliers. No less than, Miss, than Mrs. Miniver, released in 1942, or Meet Me in St. Louis, released in 1944, that did star Judy Garland. Uh, they were pure products of their historical moment. Among them, Frank Tuttle's This Gun for Hire, which released in 1942, which starred Alan, La Alan Ladd Sr., and I believe Veronica Lake was also in this gun for hire. I could I could be wrong on that. Uh, Fritz Lang's Ministry of Fear came out in 1943, and Otto Preminger's Laura came out in 1944. And of course, the landmark that bro that that brooks no argument about its ur noirness, Billy Wild Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity. Then, then Le Deluge. By 1946, you have to be blind not to know that a major strain of American cinema looked darker and grimmer, more off-kilter and unbalanced, that the secure grounding of Hollywood's moral universe was being upended and undercut. The surest way to tell something troubled was in the air was that the source is worth of pejoratives unleashed by, uh, by appalled critics. Seamy, sordid, morbid, lurid, lurid sadistic, vulgar, and, and the all-purpose fundamentally unpleasant. Christine Smith, the prime censor for the city of Atlanta, decried the post-war wave, uh, uh, decried the post-war wave of quote-unquote pictures centered around undesirable characters engaged in brutal and, sor and sordid undertakings. Since the film noir tag had not yet crossed the Atlantic, the opposition struggled for suitable terms of, 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 of um, 
Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm getting I'm getting I'm getting really tripped up of, of, of this word for suitable terms of 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 of, 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 of to to name the blight. And I know I, pro I probably tri I, pro I probably tripped over that. Um, quote unquote, murder mellers, celluloid dirt, and best of all, films of masculine brutality. The Roman Catholic Legion of Decency, the most feared pressure group turning the screws on classical Hollywood cinema, was also on high alert. The group tracked an uptick of 100% and objectionable by their lights motion picture content in the post war period and blamed the search on the backfire from World War II. Quote, Audiences had become used to pictures of great physical violence, and in the search of material to be substituted for war themes, Hollywood turned from physical violence to violence of the human spirit, explained William H. Mooring, the Legion's head film critic in 1946. Thus, we have gotten pictures that are immoral, unmoral, and culturally violent. Mooring well understood how deeply the noir vision challenged the Catholic, uh, the, ca the Catholic, Catholic, uh, Catholic, um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mispronounce this word. I'm not Catholic myself. Challenge that I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sub I'm just gonna sub the word. Uh, Mooring well understood how deeply the noir vision challenged the Catholic beliefs upheld by the Hollywood Production Code. Quote: Objections to pictures now are of a much are of a much graver nature than formerly. He said, "It's not the routine of bare legs and low cut gowns, but offenses against basic morality." Jo Joseph I. Breen, tasked with enforcing the code's golden rules, and they're referring to the Hayes Code, by the way, had a hell of a time with the Noirs. The whole atmosphere was so corrosive that the end reel, that the end reel wrapped up, wrap up fooled no one, certainly not Breen, who, certain, who seemed to understand the genre was irredeemable. It took over 10 years of, of laundering before his office greenlit James M. Cain's novel of adultery and murder, The Postman Always Wings Twice, the, the film that came out in 1946, not to be confused with the remake that starred uh, Jack, Jack Nicholson and, uh, and uh, Jessica Lange, I believe came out in the early 80s. Uh, but the mark of Cain remained on every frame. Quote, strictly for adults with an appeal chiefly to those who can stay, who can stand sordidness dished up by the carload was the verdict from the trade reviewer P Peter Harrison. And I know that we just made reference to the Hayes Code and the Hayes Code is not even referenced in this, you know, in this film history lesson of film noir, which I find pretty, pretty suspect why they wouldn't dedicate like two or three paragraphs to the Hayes Code. So guys, I am going to go ahead, pause the recording and I'm going to see if I can, if I can actually pull up the, if I can actually pull up the Hayes Code so that, you know, so that we could go over that here. All right, guys, since The Hollywood Reporter won't go into it, let's actually go into what the Hayes Code is. Now, keep in mind, I am pulling this from Wikipedia, but this is what I've heard over the years. So I'm just I'm just going to run with it. Let's just go into the background of, you know, why the Hayes Code even came into existence. And that was, you know, back in 1922, after several risque films and a series of off-screen scandals involving Hollywood stars, the studios enlisted Presbyterian elder Will H. Hayes to rehabilitate Hollywood's image. Hollywood in, the, Hollywood in the 1920s was rocked by a number of notorious scandals, such as the murder of William Desmond Taylor and the alleged rape of, of Virginia Rapp by popular, movie star, by popular movie star Fatty Arbuckle. I do believe he was later acquitted just before he died. Uh, which brought widespread condemnation from religious, civic, and political organizations. Many felt that the film industry had always been morally questionable. Political pressure was increasing, with legislators in 37 states introducing almost 100 film censorship bills in 1921. Faced with the prospect of having to comply with hundreds and potentially thousands of inconsistent and easily changed decency laws in order to show their films, the studios chose to self-regulate as the, as, the, as the preferable option. Hayes was paid the lavish sum of $100,000 a year, equal to over $1.5 million today. Hayes, Postmaster General under Warren G. Harding and former head of the Republican National Committee, served for 25 years as the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, the MPPDA, which would later go on to be renamed the, MP, the, the MPPA, and now is just referred to as the MPA for those that don't know where he quote unquote defended the industry from attacks, reciting soothing nostrums and, and negotiate treaties to seat hostilities. 
The move mimicked the decision. The move mimicked the decision Major League Baseball had made in hiring Judge Ken- in hiring Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis as league commissioner the previous year to quell questions about the integrity of baseball in the wake of the 1919 World Series gambling scandal. The New York Times even called Hayes the Screen Landis. In 1924, Hayes introduced a set of recommendations dubbed the Formula which the studios were advised to heed and asked the filmmakers to describe to his office the plots of pictures they were planning on making. The Supreme Court had already unanimously in 1915 a mutual film corporation, the Industrial Commission of Ohio, that free speech did not extend to motion pictures, and while there had been token attempts to clean up the films before, such as, such as when the studios formed the National Association of the Motion Picture Industry, uh, NAMPI, in 1916, little had, little had come of the efforts. New York became the first state to take advantage of the Supreme Court's decision by instituting a censorship board in 1921. Virginia followed suit the following year, with eight individual states having a board by the advent of sound, uh, of sound film, but many of these were ineffectual. By the 1920s, the New York stage, a frequent source of subsequent screen material, had topless shows, performances filled with curse words, adult subject matter, and sexually suggestive dialogue. Early in, the sound, early in the sound system conversion process, it became apparent that what was acceptable in New York might not, might, not bo- might not be so in Kansas. Filmmakers were facing the possibility that many states and cities would adopt their own codes of censorship, ne- necessitating a, a, mul- a multiplicity of versions of films for national distribution. Self-censorship was deemed a preferable outcome. In 1927, Hayes suggested to studio executives that they form a committee to discuss film censorship. Irving, Irving G. Thalberg of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, Sol, um, Sol Ward Sol of Fox, and E. H. Howland of Paramount responded by collaborating on a list they called the Don'ts and Be Carefuls, which was based on items that were challenged by local censors boards. This list included of this list consisted of 11 subjects best avoided and 26 to be handled very care- carefully. The list was approved by the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, and Hayes created the Studios Relations Committee, the SRC, to oversee the implementation. However, there was still no way to enforce tenants. The controversy surrounding film standards came to a head in 1929. So what what was this list? Let's actually look at what the don'ts and be carefuls list of of 1927 were. So here are the don'ts. Point of profanity by either title or lip. This includes the word God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, unless they have been used reverently in connection with the proper religious ceremonies, hell, SOB, son of a bitch, damn, God, and and every other profane and vulgar expression, however it may be spelled. Any... Oh God! I, I, they're, they're, they're doing like a word, a word salad. You know, basically, basically no nudity, in fact, or in silhouette. Any luxurious or litigious notice there, thereof by characters in the picture. Uh, number three was illegal traffic in drugs. Any interference of sex perversion, white slavery, mi- um, misgeneation, sex hygiene, and venereal diseases. Scenes of actual childbirth, in fact, or in silhouette children's sex organs, ridicule of the clergy, and willful offense to any nation, race, or creed, and be it further resolved, the special care be exercised in manner in which the following subjects are treated to the end that vulgarity and suggestiveness may be eliminated and that good taste may be emphasized. And here were the, and here were the be carefuls, not really the don'ts, but just be careful how you use them. The use of the flag international relations avoid picturizing in an unfavorable light another country's religion history institutions prominent of people and citizenry arson the use of firearms theft robbery safe cracking and dynamiting of trains mines buildings etc having in mind the effect which a too detailed description of, of these may have upon the moron so basically if 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 butch cassidy and the sundance kid were made under the Hayes code the most famous scene in the movie would never be made uh, number six, brutality and possible gruesomeness. Number seven, technique of committing murder by whatever method, methods of smuggling, third degree methods, whatever the hell third degree method. Oh, that's torture. Okay. Uh, actual hangings or electrocutions as legal punishment for crime, sympathy for criminals, attitude toward public characters and institutions, sedition, apparent, uh, apparent cruelty to children and animals, branding of people or animals, the sale of women or of a woman selling her virtue, rape or attempted rape, first night scenes, 
man and woman in bed together, deliberate seduction of girls, the institution of marriage, surgical operations, the use of drugs, titles or scenes having to do with law enforcement or law enforcing officers, excessive or lustful kissing, particularly when one character or the other is a quote unquote heavy. So basically in short, this is what the Hays Code was. It was, it was later, by, by about the 1950s is when it started getting abandoned. And now we and now we have and now we have the MPAA ratings board, you know, as, as a result as a result of all this haze code. But anyway, guys, this is enough of a tangent on the haze code. Let's get right back to the film noir film history. Resistance to film noir was not limited to film critics and censors, however. The florid chiaroscuro and extravagant lighting schemes, the very elements savored by today's noir aficionados, were disparaged by, by, by old line members of the American Society of Cinematographers as arty camera effects at odds with Hollywood's quote-unquote invisible style. All the swirling cigarette smoke, mirrored reflections, cantered angles, blinding fluorescent lights, and stinging in blackness, how was a moviegoer supposed to dive into a story with such distractions? Quote, it isn't necessary to complicate your style with trick lighting effects or odd surrealistic angles. Cinematographer Russell Meddy lectured his colleagues in 1947. Perhaps these tricks will appeal to a few artistic highbrows, but they are way above the head of the, of the average moviegoer. More seriously, a chorus of voices began tarring, tarring film noir with the most dreaded of all post-war epithets, subversive. Quote, we cannot send pictures overseas which show Americans as, sor as sordid people intent upon low objectives and willing to go to any lengths of violence to achieve them, declared an unnamed studio head who sounded an awful lot like Louis B. Mayer in 1946. Tellingly, in 1947, another vintage year for Cold Blood and Noir, uh, movies such as, you know, Crossfire, you know, not to be not to be confused with that shitty CNN show Crossfire, um, Out of the Past, the original Nightmare Alley, which Guillermo del Toro's film is a remake of, Body and Soul, They Won't Believe Me, Born to Kill, etc., etc., the House Committee on, Un on Un-American Activities launched its first round of investigations into alleged communist subversion in Hollywood. Noir and its practitioners were very much in the crosshairs. In a sense, though not in the sense of the investigators thought, uh, the HUA uh, HUAC may have been onto something. Film noir was deeply un-American in what it said about freedom, individualism, capitalism, the nature of man, not to say woman, all the, all, all the verities taught about the land of opportunities since 1776. The limitless possibilities of a beckoning frontier became an asphalt jungle of blind alleys and dead ends. Hey, that's actually a good, uh, that's actually a good noir there, uh, Asphalt Jungle. I believe it came out in 48 or 49. You know, if you, if you haven't seen Asphalt Jungle, you know, definitely, definitely check it out if you're a noir fan. Uh, where individual agency and free will counted for nothing. The, the fatalistic vision found apt expression in the genre's recurring narrative, narrative device, the flashback, the die has already been cast, your fate is already sealed, everything has happened and nothing you can do, and, no, and nothing you can do can change what comes at you uh, out, of, out of the past. Uh, sorry guys, I, 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 uh, I, 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 I misread that, and I know, and I know I jumped around a bit, so let me, let me read, let me reread that. Uh, so, so yeah, let me reread that. Where, where was I? Uh, here we go. Yeah, the die has already been cast. Your fate is already sealed. Everything has happened and nothing you can do can change what comes at you from out of your past. I loved you, Walter, and I hated him. But I wasn't going to do anything about it, not until I met you. You planned the whole thing. I only wanted him dead. And I'm the one that fixed it so he was dead. Is that what you're telling me? And nobody's pulling out. We went into this together and we're coming out at the end together. It's straight down the line for both of us. Remember? Nice reference to uh, double indemnity there. The article even makes mention of the quote, but I would much rather show show the actual clip fr fr from the movie. Basically sa says the same thing in, in, much, in much fewer words. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, Scarlet Street is not Main Street. Terry Ramsey had warned Hollywood, but Main Street made Scarlet Street and Double Indemnity. The Killers, which came out in 1946. Gilda, 
and The Postman Always Rings Twice major box office hits. Yes, the noirs played better in the big cities than in the small towns, and better with men than with women, but the genre tapped into a powerful undercurrent of popular resistance to the official story. Maybe it wasn't so un-American after all. 75 odd years later, the motion pictures that made up the high renaissance of film noir may have may have may have more outlets and play dates now than they now than they did then. In repertory markets, Blu-ray box sets, and noir-centric film festivals and television programming, Eddie Muller, TCM Sharp Dressed Noir Man, and the most reliable tipster on the genre's inside dope, calls film noir, quote, the gateway drug to classical Hollywood cinema. Get the Gen Zers hooked on the monochromatic scale and femme fatales, and soon they'll be moving on to harder stuff, maybe even silent cinema. The bit the bait is as seductive as ever. So many of the prestige musicals, biopics, and social problems films of, of the era have flatlined and faded over time, but the tough, hard-bitten noirs never seem to lose their edge. They still have the power to grab you by the collar, slap you around, and kick you in the gut. And I do have to, and I do have to agree with this. That is basically the history of, of film of film noir in, in, in a nutshell. Now, ultimately, now why now why did the genre ultimately go away? Simply, it was it was just due to oversaturation. There was so much film noir being made that at some point audiences got sick of it and moved on. You know, genres go through go through go through the go through these cycles, and you know, and guys, I'm actually going to pause the recording once more uh, because I did read something on genre cycles, and I want to make sure that I'm getting it right before before I regurgitate it. Okay, guys, I actually found what I was looking for. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't getting this wrong. So with film genres, there's uh, film, uh, film scholars have really have really come down to like the, that every every genre goes through these four stages. The first stage is primitive, right? No one really knows what it is. It's in its early stages of development. So there's, you know, obviously a lot more ex experimentation. That then leads into the classical period. So when we're looking at noir, the primitive period was in the 1920s and 30s. And the classical period hit in the 1940s, and it started to push into the 1950s. Then we get the revisionist period, and this really started to happen by about the mid to late 1950s. And the final period is the parody. And now the final period can stretch on, you know, forever and ever. And the first parody I think of with regards to film noir is Mel Brooks's High Anxiety. I know it's more of a parody of, of, of Alfred Hitchcock, but even Alfred Hitchcock, you know, d dabbled dabbled into film noir. So the fact that like, you know, the fact that Guillermo del Toro is trying to bring back film noir honestly doesn't doesn't shock me. But, you know, the 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 glory days of the genre are long gone. That doesn't mean that there hasn't been great noir made, you know, made recently. You know, you could probably think of quite a few examples off the top of your head yourself. Movies like Seven, you know, obviously, you know, obviously, you know, made in the late 90s. You know, westerns died out too, but we have gotten great westerns ever since the ever since the death of the genre, with movies like Open Range with uh, Kevin Costner and uh, and um, and uh, Robert Duvall, along with shows like Deadwood. Those came, those obviously came long after the de the death of the genre. So anyway, guys, before I tangent off for too long, this is basically film noir in a nutshell. And I'm going to go ahead and end it right here. If you stuck around this long, thanks so much for doing so. And if you've been following me long enough, you know I'm terrible at editing these videos. So I'll just see you guys uh, next time.